Okay. Uh, hello, I'm Mabel Garrison. I'm director of the center. I'm not going to speak today, uh, but I have come to welcome you to welcome Mom, please, Mona, and to um, also um, announce our very last uh, session of the semester of the year. And it's, and it's Clara Mate, who is a assistant professor of economics at the New School. Her talk is The Capital or Order, How Economists Invented Austerity and Paved the Way to Fascism. Uh, the talk will be um, April 13th at 12.30 in this room. And one of the really interesting things about this book, because it's uh, many interesting things, but it's a historical political economy of the interwar period. And one of the main actors in this book is Luigi Anaudi. So I think it will be interesting as local interest to us as well as global interest. So thank you. And I'm going to turn it over to Chris Way, who's going to introduce our speaker. Thank you. Thanks, Mabel. I actually think our speaker needs no introduction to the small but devoted crowd who's here today. I think we pretty much all know Mona well, but just in case there's someone on Zoom, I will I will uh, give the introduction. Uh, we're happy to have today to welcome back to Cornell uh, Mona Cryvel, who was previously, as most of you know, a visiting assistant professor in the government department from 2015 to 2019. Uh, a four-year period during which she was an active participant in all the activities of not only the government department, but the Institute for European Studies and a very prominent figure at the Anaudi Center. Uh, Mona got her PhD from um, the University of Mons. Um, she's currently a senior lecturer at Victoria University of Wellington in New Zealand. Um, she's one of the principal investigators for the New Zealand Electoral Study ongoing uh, panel um, survey, uh, the most important uh, public opinion enterprise in New Zealand. And Mona is uh, an expert on and has published widely on media and campaigns, uh, elections and media, and prominently recently disinformation um and uh in the media so welcome on it's really a pleasure to have you back thank you very much chris um first of all thank you very much mabel and patricia for the generous invite uh always lovely to come back to the maria naudi uh center um thank you very much sid who had his fingers in this uh, as always um, facilitated that talk i guess uh that's why it's happening uh today um, so the topic I'm going to talk about uh, today, uh, left for that in far right times, the decline of social democracy and the rise of the far right in Western Europe. Um, so this thing, hopefully one day, is supposed to become a book project. Um, so it is not quite there yet. Um, so I'm testing out some of my ideas and arguments on you today. So if they stick, I might flash that out and <laughs> it ends up in the book project. But currently, it's kind of an argumentative uh, draft. Um, so uh, let me start. So does it, oh, is it connected? No, I'm not sure. Is it not working? Point it at me, maybe. So maybe at you once. Maybe I'll just put it in and out once again. So it comes back. But let me check. No, it's no, not reacting. I can do it for you. So maybe you have to click to the to the uh, next slide. But then let me just quickly open my slides here. So when I have to tell you that you have to click, <laughs> if I don't, I uh, can't do it myself. So that I know. That I also see them. All right. So did it turn on? Maybe it's just turned off. Uh, it was turned on. Yes, it is. But it's not. No, it is. Ah, it took a while. The in and out thing worked. <laughs> so, all right. So uh, let's start with the decline of social democracy and the rise of the far right. So these are a lot of headlines um, from media from all over the world um, that are suggesting that there has been a decline of social democracy in Western Europe and the rise of the far right. Um, so let me read out some of them for you. So for example, what is causing the right of, uh, rise of today's global far right? Um, how the far right became Europe's new normal? Who killed European social democracy? Um, the right is rising and social democracy is dying across Europe, but why? 
So a lot of the media actually suggests that those two kind of co-occurring trends in Western European party systems that we see are kind of related. Um, but as social scientists, we usually do know better. Just because two things are occurring at the same time, they are not necessarily causally related. So we have to check out if this is actually the case and those two stories um, are related. Um, so that is why we are going to ask several questions today, or I'm going to try to answer them for you traditionally in that talk. The first one is, why is social democracy in Western Europe suffering in recent decades? Um, and the second one is, um, the one that's kind of mirroring that, why is the far right, on the other hand, thriving at the same time? So, and uh, we have to ask, are these two trends, like the media suggests, in Western European party systems indeed related? So these are the uh, three main questions, but of course, I think in the back of everyone's mind, a few other questions come up, um, because we are also asking ourselves, is there, if there is this decline of social democracy, is there actually a way out of that dilemma for social democracy? So what would they have to do to kind of bounce back um, to their old glory days? Um, so meaning um, kind of what kind of strategies would they have to adopt? And that has to do a lot with policy, of course. So in other words, what policies should social democrats adopt to win voters back? I have to say that I confine this talk mostly to Western Europe because of course the story of social democracy in Eastern Europe is a completely different one. And so a lot of the arguments that I make probably would not hold. Um, and so there we would have to fact factor in other different, uh, a different historical context um, to the story. So this is a Western European story. So as we don't fall for all clickbaits in the media, let us check first um, if the point of departure is correct, actually. So has social democracy been declining uh, in recent years? So here we see the average vote share of social democratic parties um, across 17 European countries. Um, and so mostly it has been decl uh, declining in the early 2000s. Um, and probably the, the most, um, the biggest event uh, that has started uh, this talk about the decline of social democracy um, was the 2012 election uh, in Greece, um, where the PASOK party, who has been pretty dominant for a long time, um, had a catastrophic result. Um, and since then, this kind of decline uh, of social democracy is also known uh, as PASOK. Passification, difficult word. Um, so you will forget it probably in a second, but it's difficult. Uh, and so um, they have had uh, an average uh, loss of 10 to 15 percentage points uh, over that period. Um, so definitely a lot. So we can say there is a decline of social democracy in Western Europe. So does that also hold if we look at kind of individual countries? So it might sound a little paradoxical to you to uh, at the moment that since 2005, Germany has a social democratic chancellor again for the first time. Finland, Denmark, uh, Norway all have social democratic prime ministers at the moment. Um, but we should not forget if we, for example, take the, the German case, um, that uh, this was their third worst result in the post-war period for the Social Democrats. In Finland, it was their second worst since 1924. Um, so you can also win elections if you lose less than others in, in uh, and make small gains uh, in an election. And in that specific case, the center-right parties had pretty bad candidates, uh, and that can happen from election to election. And it was actually kind of a, a short bounce back, but it's probably not the point yet where we can say this would turn the trend around that we have seen for a long time. And what you see is kind of going down basically in all of those uh, cases uh, that we have here uh, in Western uh, Europe. Um, so, yeah. Is the Italian data the Demo Democratic Party? Uh, the Italian data should be the Democratic Party, I believe. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I would have to look back. Um, that is from, from um, yeah. I would have to check back, but I think it's it's the Democratic Party. Um, so, but at the same time, this what has constituted that narrative um, that the rise of the far right in any way is kind of related to the decline of social democracy, because we see this almost kind of parallel trends in a certain way. So while social democracy it was going down from them for them over time, the far right actually has been doing better and better. Uh, from election to election and has made a lot of gains uh, in the same period. And that has constituted a narrative that both things are related somehow. But is this really the case? Um, but first of all, here we also see kind of the success um, of uh, the rise of nationalism in Europe. 
This is a little outdated because it's from 2019, so it's not fully correct anymore, but it tells you that in, in recent years, they have been doing pretty well uh, across uh, Europe, the far right. Um, but are these developments really related? I would say, uh, and I try to convince you of it, the answer must be no, or at least not for the most part, um, because there's another player that we haven't factored in yet um, that plays a big role. So the majority of vote, uh, voters that social democratic parties have lost in recent year, I will show you they have actually lost to green parties and not to the radical right parties. Um, so that's uh, the first point. And social democratic parties have lost far more voters in the educated middle class and among the working uh, than among the working class uh, in any case. So the working class, as many suggest, is not their problem. Their problem is the loss of the educated middle class, and in particular, educated young voters, as we will see. So their competitor is within the left block, um, and it's not actually on, on the opposite. Um, it's not far-right parties. Um, far, the trend for far-right parties um, is caused by something else. So am I right about that? So here we see actually based on national election study data uh, for a lot of countries from 2000 to 2018, um, where voters have gone to from social democratic parties since 2000. Uh, and we see uh, that the majority actually has gone to green parties. Um, several have also gone to the center right parties. Um, that will be another interesting uh, uh, part that we might have to uh, kind of uncover why this is the case. Um, the Green parties, uh, I will explain uh, in a second. Center-right parties first. Um, a lot of the center-right parties have actually moved a little bit to the left during that period. A uh, prominent example, Angela Merkel's 16 years has been a social democratization of the Christian Democrats uh, in Germany. Um, and so like even things like um, uh, the um, making gay marriage legal uh, and stuff like that has made uh, center-right parties also attractive for uh, progressive uh, voters. So they have actually moved a little uh, to the left. Um, so that might be a part of, part of the story. Um, but why the Green parties? Um, so here we see that green, the Green parties might be the new left uh, in Europe. Um, this is a worldwide map, but of course we also see uh, Europe here. They have been doing pretty well in recent years. Uh, in some countries, uh, at certain points uh, in kind of the polling before elections, they have even been before the Social Democrats uh, and people were kind of talking about um, will there be kind of a Green Party, uh, a Green Party led government. Um, but um, and part of the story that explains uh, this um, is kind of, uh, also let, let us look uh, to the other side first, the voter movements to radical right parties since 2000. Um, so did they actually get from social voters from the social democrats? Not that much if we look at that. Um, the, the radical right parties apparently got their voters from the center right uh, in the same period, and they got their voters from, from the non-voter camp. Why? If we factor in that the center right probably has made a little bit of a move to the left, um, uh, then they have not taken clear stances on immigration policies and others and have left a void in the party system uh, for far right parties. Um, on the other hand, the non voter bloc, uh, these are people that are usually completely tuned out of politics. So, what has triggered them to come back uh, into politics? Um, things like the refugee crisis. Um, where actually center-right parties have not uh, taken um, a stance that they thought probably was right uh, enough. Uh, and they have uh, found an attractive offer in the far-right parties now. So what they, where they have clearly not gotten their voters from is from social democracy uh, or not to, to a huge uh, extent. Um, so I think that argument that a lot of the media makes um, that the decline of the social democratic parties and the rise uh, of the far-right, on the other hand, would be related as basically almost that at this point uh, already. So what explains the electoral decline of social democracy? The story is green is the new red, that's what I would say. Um, and green parties are the real competitor of social democratic parties uh, these days. Um, so a reason for this might actually be that um, social democratic parties have been late adopters of progressive policies, in particular on the cultural dimension. 
So on LGBTQ rights and climate change, they have been adopted by green parties a lot earlier than by social democratic parties. Um, and so they matter for young and highly educated voters um, who have given their votes to green parties uh, instead. And when the social democratic parties who are not opposing them discovered them, there was already somebody else who was competent uh, in that field. And they were just a copycat. Um, a first hint in that direction could be that the voters they have lost to the Green parties are highly educated and young, which is usually the most progressive group who cares about these issues the most. Um, I will show you what the kind of uh, voters are that they have lost uh, in a second. Um, so um, if we look at this by education, so who did social democratic parties lose voter movement by education? Uh, we have broken that down here to people below higher secondary education, higher secondary education, vocational training, and college education. Uh, and these are the green parties here. So we see that among the people with higher education, most of the voters that social democratic parties have lost are highly educated people. Um, so those are the people that um, care about the progressive cultural dimension uh, issues, um, LGBTQ rights, climate change, um, education policies, uh, equality, childcare, and that uh, kind of stuff. Um, so probably on the education side, uh, this story holds. What about explaining the electoral success of the far right, on the other hand, if that's not a social democratic story? Um, the refugee crisis um, has actually scared a lot of center-right voters uh, as well. Um, and so this has surely been a contributing factor to the success of the far right. Um, and it is the center right, which is the party family who has lost most voters uh, to the far right. Um, the center right in the eyes of some conservative voters might not have positioned itself far enough to the right in the refugee crisis and thereby left a void in the party system for far right parties. Um, by the way, if you ask for a story for center right parties to get out of that, New research has now shown if they take a harder stance in immigration policies, they can't win any voters back because now the far right has basically the tech on that. They own the issue. They now own the issue, yes. And so it doesn't help center right parties anymore if they try now try to take a, a tougher stance on immigration policies. Um, this often gets actually unnoticed in the media because at the same time, the center right parties have also won votes from social democratic parties. Um, so the center right parties never pop up. Uh, in that story and get lost somehow. Um, and the far right also owes a lot of their success to the block of the non-voters, where I believe that it was events like the refugee crisis who were a trigger enough to kind of get them to uh, engage and turn out, which they usually uh, do not do. Now, you could argue currently migration policies are not as salient as they were during the refugee crisis. So this is probably a little bit over. So which, of course, is an electoral disadvantage for the far right. So is there hope that this far right success is over soon? Unfortunately, I would argue not, um, because I think the far right has learned very well in the meantime. Um, so they have learned how to serve the agenda. And that's their most successful strategy at the moment. And an example of that um, has been how they occupy new topics quickly and give them a national frame. As an example of that has been the COVID-19 debates. Um, and also their attempt uh, to take over the anti-vaxxer movements in several countries. So a typical example is the hashtag Corona Jihad, the China virus, this kind of framing. Um, so they have been blaming different immigrant groups uh, in different European countries, depending on which was the biggest immigrant group in that country. So in Germany, it was the Muslims' fault, uh, who are not clean, uh, have been breaking lockdown rules. Um, they also use this as an opportunity to blame governments uh, for authoritarian uh, behavior. Um, and so to attack governments and mobilize uh, against governments. In other countries, um, Jewish people uh, have been uh, blamed for that. Um, it has, uh, has given them the chance to make anti-globalization uh, statements, as you see uh, in, in the picture above here. They have very much learned, once the refugee crisis and immigration policy was not a salient topic anymore, that they need something new. They now basically jump on new topics, and they did it pretty successful already uh, with the coronavirus stuff. And suddenly, they were marching side by side in those anti-lockdown protests with hippies and kind of people that we would probably assume would be Green Party voters, um, who have not been, uh, did not understand that they are now marching with the far right. 
Um, so can social democracy in any kind of form, is there a chance for social democracy to bounce back uh, from that? So what are the challenges? Um, Social, the first big problem here is social democratic voters are aging or dying out. So they are kind of a dinosaur at the moment, a little bit. Um, and so uh, here we see the, the case of the, the German SPD when we had the 2002 election. Um, basically, all age groups were kind of churning out for the SPD in the more or less same way. 2021 is starting a totally different one. It's mostly the old people, and there's kind of a gap of uh, kind of 20 percent point between the youngest um, uh, and the oldest uh, age bracket uh, turning out for social democrats. So they are now only voted for by old people. It's the most, in, in one model that I ran, it was the most significant variable age, um, which, is, which is kind of unbelievable. It, it, it explained more than party identification. Um, and so, um, if you are not believing that story yet, um, maybe I can convince you if we compare that to the 2017 election. So the older uh, people get, the more votes Social Democrats have won in the 2021 election compared to 2017. Um, if we look at the younger cohorts, they have lost people or it kind of uh, stayed the same. Um, and did these votes really go to the Green parties, as I argue, um, the young voters that they have lost, the educated middle class people who care about progressive issues? Um, so if we look at the vote share uh, of the Green Party um, uh, over the, the elections from 2002 to 2021, uh, we actually see um, that uh, with the age groups, like the younger age groups, 18 to 24, 25 uh, to uh, 34, um, that this has been increasing the people who turned out uh, for Green parties. So the Green parties won more and more young voters uh, over time. They also won uh, in the other age groups, but in particular, um, the young people uh, see them as the new left and as their home. Um, why is this a big problem? Uh, for the social democratic parties. Um, if young people vote for them, uh, they are still in a phase of political socialization in a certain way. And repeated voting can also lead to kind of um, developing a party identification um, for the green parties. And those um, voters would then be lost for an entire lifetime for the social democrats once they have developed a stable green party identity as their left identity that could have been social democratic uh, identity maybe. Um, so if you don't believe me yet, maybe that uh, GAM model uh, convinces you. So if we look by, um, by when people were born, um, so we actually see the later people were born, the higher is the probability that they turn out for a green party uh, instead of a social democratic uh, party um, so that they would choose uh, that one. Um, so what is the other challenge? It's not the only one um, that they have to confront. Um, so the party landscape overall has all uh, changed in most European party systems. There are far more parties these days than they were in the past. So for a long time, uh, most Western European party systems actually have been moderate multi-party systems. Um, now they are turning into real multi-party systems or even extreme multi-party systems. And a lot of them have between four to eight parties uh, nowadays. Um, catch all party systems don't work out that well uh, in these kind of uh, real multi-party systems compared to moderate multi-party systems. Um, because um, basically you have to take a clear stance um, and make clear what you are standing for ideologically uh, in such an extreme multi-party system or real multi-party system. Uh, and this kind of catch-all centrist strategy is not working uh, that well anymore under those uh, party systems. Um, so centrist positions will be less attractive, uh, which is also reflected in the vote share of catch-all parties in general. So you see that catch-all parties together, taken together, if we take the center right and the center left together, make less and less of um, their vote share is smaller and smaller, while the vote share of small parties goes up. And in particular, what you see often labeled in surveys as other parties, all the smaller ones, um, their share uh, in the results uh, also go up. Um, extreme multi-party systems are party systems that have an offer for everyone. It's like Netflix. Uh, it's not that you have to watch television and what they uh, broadcast that evening you have to take. Um, it's basically like there's a menu for everyone. Everyone gets their personal um, uh, stuff. Um, 
So that means you have to take a clear stance. Um, so where do I was? Uh, would the programmatic move to the right help? Very often it has been suggested because of the argument uh, that social democratic parties would have lost uh, voters um, uh, to the far right party. The argument that very often uh, has been made is that they should kind of programmatically make a shift to the right and that this would help them. The answer is probably it would not win them any uh, working class voters back. First of all, the working class is not their biggest problem anyway. The second uh, argument is the working class is also not a monolithic block of white men, uh, as some people imagine them. So this is not the case anymore. Today's working class in Europe has changed. It's getting increasingly female and also includes a lot of people with a migration background. Um, and they are not uh, inconsiderable groups of the working class. Um, and a lot of them advocate for progressive uh, positions. Um, so uh, female voters are much less likely to turn out for far right parties, uh, for example, um, than male voters are. Um, and also people with a migration background are less likely. Um, so if we look at today's working class, we see that the group, of course, of men without a migration background, uh, the white men, particularly among the production workers, of course, is still the biggest group. But we see that there's also considerable other groups, um, like uh, women without uh, and with a, um, a migration background, uh, and they have become uh, more over time. So the, the working class in Europe is getting far more diverse. Um, so, what about their attitudes? I have just. Uh, what is the x axis mean on these, these charts? Um, so, you, that the x axis is a kind of percentage here in that case. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and here we have it for class and therefore education. Okay. Um, so it's not numbers, because I was thinking that also numerically it shifted from production workers to service workers. Yes. So you're, yeah. you're moving people, percentages plus you're moving people out of that category yes. into the other one over time. Yeah. Um, because of course there has also been this, this, this explains partly why we have more female. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so um, if we think about, we have just um, suggested that those people would, if they are not uh, white men, they wouldn't have these kind of authoritarian uh, attitudes. They would have progressive attitudes, um, but we can also check if they have progressive attitudes. So here's a survey item, gay and lesbian people should live as they wish. Um, so we do see fully agree, production workers, service workers, they fully agree with that kind of argument. So they have more progressive attitudes than we would assume probably. Um, and if you look at educated uh, uh, people, they are the biggest group um, of those who support that kind of stuff. So a move to the right when it comes to the cultural dimension would probably backfire with those highly educated voters that they have lost to the green parties. It would also not be a win with the working class. So that would be a wrong assumption. Um, but this is just one item. Um, so if I give you more, um, maybe you believe it then. Um, so here we have another one. The culture of a country is going to be destroyed or enriched by immigration. We see um, uh, across um, the production workers, service workers, most of the people agree that uh, a culture of a country is enriched by immigration and kind of say yes to an immigration uh, country in a certain way. Again, people with uh, a college degree and higher education, they also sign off uh, on that kind of progressive uh, policy. Even if we take a more controversial one, so that was the most controversial one, immigration makes the country a better or a worse place. Um, so here the um, agreement with that, uh, or the agreement with that it makes a better place uh, is not as big anymore. Uh, but at least production workers and service workers are still kind of placed themselves on the middle of the scale. So that also does not tell you that left nationalist parties would be a big win with the working class in Europe these days. Um, people with a college degree are actually even more on the side um, uh, of kind of uh, saying, um, so we, where do we have them here? They go, they go more to the kind of better side. They tend more to that. So with them, it would be even a bigger loss. So um, take home messages uh, from that. Um, first of all, social democracy uh, is declining while the far right in Western Europe is rising. That story uh, is true for that part. Um, however, social democracy is not a victim of the rise of the far right. Um, in recent years, it has primarily lost voters to the Green parties as a result of a late adoption of progressive policies on the cultural dimension. 
Um, the far right, on the other hand, has profited a lot from the refugee crisis and the center right parties leaving a void for them regarding strict immigration policy stances. Um, since then, they have also learned to successfully embrace new opportunities like COVID and adopt other policies. They have seen that this was successful and they probably go on with it uh, and make certain topics with the right framing their topics. Um, so to be able to survive. We have seen this with the Ukraine and Russia. Now the kind of weird conspiracy arguments they make in that field as soon as the media moves on to a new topic, the far right is there and gives it the right framing, which they haven't done that successfully in the past. Um, so social democracy's biggest problem in getting back to old glory is that those parties are aging, which means that they have to first and foremost try to target progressive young voters and break into those green age brackets. They better do it fast and do it now, because otherwise the same thing happens to them that another paper has already shown for the uh, center-right parties. If you now take a tough stand on immigration, you are just a COVID cat and you don't win more, they will still vote for the original. Um, and adopting more left nationalist policies would not help. The working class is not the group they have lost anyway. The working class is also not simply white men with authoritarian attitudes. Europe's working class is increasingly female, has a migration background and stands behind progressive policies these days. So moving to the right would backfire as more educated young voters would choose green parties. And at the same time, it would also not uh, increase the appeal of social Democrats to working class voters, which a classic democratic uh, uh, social democratic position should still be attractive. So classic redistributional uh, left policies um, from uh, cost benefit argument from a rational choice perspective. There's no reason why they should these days not be attractive to working class uh, voters. Typical centrist catch all party positions are less attractive the more Europe's once moderate multi party system turn into real or even extreme multi party systems, um, in which you have to make uh, a clear uh, stand, a clear point where you are standing on something. Um, there is truly no one size fits all solution for social democracy in every country, because of course we have to factor in country factors if we would go down to the country level. But there are definitely um, some things across Europe that we can recommend, like progressive policies targeting young voters, and some that we cannot recommend to social democratic uh, parties, like left, left nationalists or the centri uh, centrist manifestos, the later ones they have run unsuccessfully since a few years now, or uh, decades now already. Um, so it's probably uh, over with that. So that's it from my side. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to take your questions and comments. Whoever takes questions, I'm not sure. Yeah. Who <laughs> I do. Okay. So, <laughs> so um, <clears throat> I confess that I'm coming from both a social democratic and a sociological mm -hmm. background. And in my sociological background, I'm very influenced by the Italian <clears throat> industrial sociologist, Carlo Frigilia, mm -hmm. who I've mentioned to you. And Carlo has come out with a book with the same dependent variables as you have. Mm -hmm. But in contrast to you, he argues that the same trends are responsible for both for both the loss of social democratic votes and the rise of extreme right wing votes. Mm -hmm. And the difference is he's doing an essentially structuralist argument. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> what connects the two are something I didn't hear you talk about, at least not in this paper, mm -hmm. and that is changes in the nature of capitalism. Mm -hmm. And Virginia argues that it's structural changes in the nature of capitalism, which separately are responsible for the loss of social democratic votes and the rise of far right votes. So it's not like the two are directly connected. It's that both of them are affected by a third and macro structural factor, changes in the nature of capitalism. And I confess, I should have given you Carlo's book before uh, now. I didn't realize this is what you were going to talk about, but it's extre extremely relevant. It's, it's what I consider an intelligent 
counter argument to your argument. By intelligent, what I mean is it, it brings in unmeasured intervening variables. And where you are looking, you seem to be looking at the two camps in relation to each other. <clears throat> and you clearly have shown that the two camps are not clearly co-responsible for these changes. He would argue that you're leaving out structural changes in the nature of capitalism, which I wonder what you have to say about. Mm. So yes, first of all, I didn't make any macrostructural no. argument. So that is that is completely right. Uh, and I haven't looked at that. Um, so I have to check out his book. Um, it could be that he's right about the story. My story has been more, I think, a micro level story in a certain way. And I wanted to make it an even more micro level story, mm -hmm. I have to say, <laughs> because my other plan was for that book thing to do interviews with the parties uh, and ask them who they actually are targeting um, how they interpret their losses and their wins uh, to bring in the, the factor of the party and kind of to acknowledge party agency in that whole game, which I think the current literature has not done. So they are, we are always victims. Uh, there is no agency of the party, but it also matters how you interpret certain things. Uh, and if they don't see the story that I see, I can recommend whatever I want. They won't get out of that if they have a different theory on why this is happening. So I had definitely a different approach to it, a much more micro approach. So it is probably worth to look into the, the macro approach. Um, I'm not sure what he argues are the kind of changes of capitalism um, that lead to that. But well, for example, the decline of the unionized working class. Mm -hmm. So rather than simply saying there are fewer workers, he's not looking at that. What he's looking at is the decline of unionization which was and still is a socializing factor mm -hmm. into social democratic attitudes from working class voters. Uh, so if you take the same population and you de-unionize it, mm -hmm. then that population is susceptible to far right arguments. Yeah, but I don't think that this is that this is kind of opposite to my argument mm -hmm. uh, in a certain way. So if we don't unionize the younger generations anymore, for example, and they are not getting socialized into that, and I see the dying union argument totally would buy that, um, isn't that, because there was never this connection between the Green parties and the unions, for example, isn't that actually something that should drive them into the Green parties? So if, I'm not sure that my story and his story actually rule each other out, but it would be kind of a complementary perspective. Can I just, I, I, said I have to, I have to know, so I have to know 15 minutes, but I want to just follow up on this because I, I agree with what, what a lot of what Sid is saying, and I agree with your story, and if you look, uh, I mean, I have some data that goes back to 1970, and this relationship is an interesting up and down, and um, so I like the way you presented it. I think the Green Party is really important in the story, and also the age, the generation thing is very important. But there's also a sort of middle space that doesn't speak to what Sidney just brought up, and also a little bit about the fact that you're going this micro dimension. And, and it's a question that nobody really asks, and that is you sort of think about, you sort of forget, and I'm using that just globally, so it is money directed that these parties, the social democrats, I mean, we sort of think of them as ideological contracts, basically, because we're intellectuals and academics and we're looking at them. But I think maybe it's worthwhile stepping back a little and asking ourselves and thinking about what did they actually deliver to those people? And they delivered different things in different countries. Um, and certainly it speaks to the economic issues, the macro level issues too. And where did they go off the rails? because they sort of went off the rails. I mean, they went off the rails when they became technocratic and they became technocratic in, in a lot of different ways. But it seems to me, and you might get at this with, you know, in a, in a sort of interview kind of thing, but it seems to me that, that it would be worthwhile thinking about what they did originally, not so much what they did, not so much, but what they delivered. And when they stopped delivering that, and then, to what extent did the right step into that gap? And the right couldn't do anything until it was except verbiage, until it actually started winning elections. It's not clear what they're delivering anyway. But it's something worth thinking about when you think about this relationship, which is actually, you know, it's clearly there. 
causality, causality. And then we could say that's open for mm -hmm. discussion and testing interpretation. Um, but I want to put that question out there. Very interesting, very good talk. And I have about five more minutes I can stay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Let me take a quick. Um, yeah. So um, where did they went off the rails um, and what did they deliver? Um, so I think when it comes to the loss of the working class, it's not that they haven't lost anyone to the working class. They have also lost some people to the working class, uh, some working class people yeah. that way around. Um, so I think um, there, I think a lot came off. Uh, it started with Tony Blair's uh, third way, Gerhard Schröder's gender policies and other stuff when they moved away from classic redistributional uh, policies of social democratic parties. I think that is still what the working class would be in their interest and what they want to see. It took a few years for that effect to trickle in, I believe, um, because I mean, like it takes a while until you see the effect of those policies on the working class and on your own pocket. Um, so I think this is where they went off the rails with the working class. Um, with the younger generation, um, that they did not socialize them anymore. In anymore. This is probably partly a story of a macro thing. So uh, we have we have we don't have these kind of uh, so social context milieus anymore. Uh, in which people are socialized into social democratic parties because of lots of mobility. So these are structural factors um, and individualization. Um, so we are not growing into social democracy anymore from kindergarten and socialist uh, song evenings and all that kind of stuff. And they help you out with everything. Um, so the younger generation, they have, I think, way too soon. They have just seen the, the Green parties for a long time, not as a real competitor, but the ones that give, that give them a few more votes to form a coalition um, that they need to, uh, should not attack too, too much during a campaign. Um, but they have not seen that they have picked up topics that matter to the young generation, like climate change, LGBTQ rights, uh, and uh, other things, and that the, the Green parties have become experts on those topics and competent on that. So I think they went off the rail with the younger generations in realizing way too late that this is topics you need to care about, um, mm -hmm. which probably had to do with the working class in a certain way, because the climate change thing for the social democratic parties was a big struggle. Um, so how do you lobby for the workers? Uh, and at the same time, because they have been working in some of the industries that haven't been very climate friendly and uh, others. So the social democratic parties had a bit of, of a problem, I think, in that respect and left that to the green parties, thinking they would get them a few more votes uh, to form a coalition. Um, but they have missed out that this is a topic that a whole generation um, cares about the most. And so I think they went off in two, in two different wrong directions, um, figuring out what the younger generation wants uh, and uh, taking away from their core working class voters with the period that came after Tony Blair, Gerhard Schröder, uh, and others and following those kind of first, yeah. yeah. Uh, Ken, I think, has to leave. Sorry, Chris. I think I'm going to take Ken first. I think Ken go first. Thank you. I'm just curious in looking at your argument. I'm trying to. I'm trying to sort out is, is this a story? I think I can see sort of a couple of different macro level, mm -hmm. uh, macro in a different way from what Sid was talking about, but sort of macro level explanations for, for what's going on. One would be that this is a story about polarization. Mm -hmm. um, you know, center right's losing votes to the far right, center left is losing votes to the radical left or to the Greens. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a story about polarization. Mm -hmm. Another alternative interpretation would be that this is a story of the politicization of a cultural axis of contestation that is orthogonal to the conventional left-right economic axis mm -hmm. um, on, on both the left and the right, whether or not we should be calling it a, a right, you know, especially as they shift leftwards on economic policies, a different different question. Yeah. Um, um, but a third, a third sort of macro interpretation would be that this is a story of, of a, a, you know, whether you call it a new generational cleavage or just a fading of you know, the Bartolini and Mayor Cleavage about the time they wrote their book and sort of the emergence of new, a new generational politics uh, and the old cleavage no longer captures it. And mm -hmm. so you get, you know, some sort of new cleavage that, that is emerging, capturing the younger voters. Mm -hmm. Which, what, do any of those three resonate with your understanding of what this story is about? And does one or does one of them make more sense than the others? Her. Um, I'm not sure it has to be one story or the other uh, in that case, given how big the trends are that you see here. When you think about that gap directly at the beginning, the, the very uh, one of the very first uh, slides, I think 
it is hardly explained by one of those factors alone, uh, what you see there. So there is, there is more than um, uh, one story uh, probably going on. The polarization story I like as well, in particular when I think about France, um, where you have seen how many voters have run away from the center right and the center left and from the big parties and are now voting for the radical left or the radical right um, and have uh, kind of settled uh, there and they have been gaining voters um, to a high extent. So there, there is a certain kind of, I think, an increasing polarization um, uh, in a certain way. Um, the cultural story is the one that I have partly tried to sell to you because I think the cultural axis is meanwhile much more important than the economic axis or similarly important than the economic axis was for a long time. That I think explained more in the past and the cultural dimension has become more important. Um, so the new generation cleavage, ah, yes, it is partly that. I'm always a little hesitant in directly calling everything a cleavage. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, it is probably a big thing, but um, there have been so many people that whatever popped up, they have constituted a new cleavage. None of this did stick for a long time. So I'm always a little hesitant to directly speak of a new, new cleavage uh, uh, in a certain way. Um, also, a, a cleavage is not only the difference that we see there, and if it get, does it get uh, politicized uh, in a certain way. And I'm not even sure the Green parties have yet understood. They, they have been celebrating uh, their wins and whatever, and suddenly the German Green Party has chancellor candidates because they know they now can get there. But I think they have not uh, already fully understood um, where they have actually hit the social democratic parties the hardest. Um, and so they could make more uh, of that uh, probably. But yeah, I think it is it is basically a lot of those uh, stories at the same time, given how big this is what we see here, uh, and not just one of those stories alone that would explain it all. Um, so yeah, <laughs> I haven't settled on one yet. Maybe strategically I should. <laughs> probably more in a micro camp than in a macro camp. I'm definitely a micro level person, not a macro level person. Uh, so yeah, so it doesn't exclude the other. No, it doesn't. I think you and I and I think that it's the background story. Indeed, but the the um, the, the idea of left libertarian versus cultural and conservative mm -hmm. that idea goes back to the to the seventies and eighties with mm -hmm. Kitschelt uh, and so forth. Um, that's not a cleavage. No, what was what was and still is a cleavage. Is something that's based in social reality, and and I think the cultural cleavage, the cultural quote unquote cleavage, is not based in social social reality. Or we could argue that <laughs> no, not not the same as the as the working class bourgeois cleavage. I'm going to, I'm not really contradicting, but and I have to leave too. But but I you know I think too that one doesn't exclude the other, and the thing is. You know, we've got a few things going on. This phenomenon is happening in all of Western Europe. I agree, East Europe is something different. But then each one, and this is where I think the culture story is, is important, is that there's this thing that I call deep culture. And the deep culture, there's a kind of generalized deep culture in the old Western Europe. Old Western Europe. You know, there's a path of conservatism, Protestant. But then in each one of these national spaces, the activity, the acting out of that is quite different. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that's that's where the culture will probably come in. Um, and I think culture is really important, as I argue, and that one of the economics are also very important in the mm -hmm. story. And that's where the issue of where, where what they delivered in, in the sense and how they articulated that. And they probably articulated that differently in different spaces and different things spoke to that what a deep cultural meaning that you know, there are these things that everybody will understand. And I will understand it in America, you will understand. I always am shocked when I go to Europe or any place different how American I feel when I don't feel very American. I never get more German than when I moved to the US. Yeah, so yeah, I know. So that kind of thing doesn't work and it's close for you know Donald Trump or something like that. It just means there are these things. Yeah, but you realize it in a different context. 
So yeah, well, maybe I have to go, unfortunately. <laughs> but anyway, thank you very much. We can talk, we can talk more. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm looking to go. I have lots of questions. This is so interesting, Mona. So, um, so we have ignored poor Chris. <laughs> yeah, one, one comes from your discussion with Mabel is I want to push back a little bit on your characterization and Mabel's characterization of mistakes made by the social democrats mm -hmm. or two mistakes. I think when we tell a mistake narrative, we always think like it's a different choice space for the actor. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't think the, the, the mistakes were never necessarily exogenous. Mm -hmm. But I think they might have been endogenous and it might have mm -hmm. been hard to avoid them. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking this in two ways. When we go back, say, to the 1990s, when a lot of social democratic parties moved to the center, mm -hmm. um, one, I'm going to say there was the widespread perception um, that a lot of their redistributive strategies and economic strategies were no longer available under an era of globalization mm -hmm. and the deepening of European integration. Mm -hmm. So those strategies were. Those policy options that they traditionally relied on, relied on were no longer available. Mm -hmm. So that partly explains the mistake. Um, and the second is I would, and I think some of these you, you say which is so interesting, is that the Social Democrats lost out because they were slow to move to progressive cultural issues and they lost the young voters to the Greens. Again, I'm gonna say, if you look back 30 years ago, I don't think the working class was as progressive as your data from recent years shows. I'm, I'll just bet that um, they were more constrained by their core constituencies, social values 30 years ago than they are today. Mm -hmm. And it was, would have been harder for them to make that shift back then than it is today. So I'm going to argue both of their mistakes are understandable mistakes, mm -hmm. uh, but were kind of structurally induced uh, by partly by yeah. the cultural situation was different 30 years ago, changes in the economy help, help explain it. Okay, that's one, one comment, mm -hmm. one question. The second is, Here's the conclusion I draw from your talk about the future, and I'm curious if you agree with it. Uh, the situation is hopeless for social democrats. <laughs> okay, <laughs> pretty much it's really depressing. And I see like a, a new stylized, typical European party system emerging, which is that we have more parties than we used to, but the three primary players in most countries will be the Greens, a center-right party or a center party, and right-wing populists. And because the social democrats are in a irredeemable position and they're just gonna, they're gonna fade slowly. So I think that's one possible conclusion I hear because I hear your, your analysis is being very, very pessimistic for social democracy. Okay. Mm. And see, okay. see if you agree with that. And if you agree with that, then I I wonder, you know, why do the social democrats seem to be in more shape than center right parties? And I know center right parties are facing challenges too, but it just seems based on everything I've looked at, that it's worse for social democrats. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if that might not also tie into structural changes in the economy. For example, decline in unionization, because they're usually in their uh, vote base and the way they face mm -hmm. both organize them and socialize them in a way center right parties or not. Mm -hmm. Well, a lot, a lot of points. Uh, where do I start? Well, they just build up over time when you do all yes. these other um, questions. <laughs> The, the mistake thing, yeah, that is, of course, uh, it depends on from, from which I think angle you come on that strategically. Um, I think it was a mistake. Um, and so, but a mistake that they probably thought, um, so they had <laughs> at that time that would modernize social democracy and take them to the 21st century. These were also basically the arguments that Blair and Schröder and others made, um, taking the party to the 21st century, because there would be no alternative. These Tina policies, yeah. there is no alternative uh, to those uh, policies. Um, and so that's why they took the course. It back then already nearly kind of killed those parties, because I mean, like the left wings of those parties, partly have even left, like the Social Democrats in Germany would have never had the VSG which then later joined the left party and made the, the left party stronger in the west of Germany um, if they would not have followed Gerhard Schröder's path. So it has nearly already kind of torn the Social Democrats uh, apart taking that uh, path. So I think in a certain way, um, and I mean, like also the effects that we have now seen of uh, Agenda 2010 and, and Hartz IV, I think have not been positive effects. That's why they have taken it back partly. So I would still say it is a mistake, but to them at the point of time, it must have looked like this is what take is taking us to the 21st century. So I would say definitely the word mistake depends on the angle you come from. The perspective that 
that government and those governments had at that time was probably the one that this is the future. Um, uh, so that is that is right. The more conservative, um, yeah, I think this has happened over time, but the non, so probably the, the working class was not as progressive. So I could go back in election studies actually and check how they have answered similar items in the past. Um, so where was the point where social democracy should have realized that this cultural dimension is becoming salient? And that it's important for the younger uh, generation. Um, probably you see the people that um, think that climate change is the most important topic in the MIP question. So it's climbing up, like making a few places probably all the time. Um, but then I think an argument for in the book, doing the qualitative interviews with the parties, because I, I think they are left out in the story so far and asking them how they interpret the situations and how they have interpreted uh, in, in the past. Um, so what do they think guarantees them success? What has brought them uh, bad election results? Who are they targeting? Um, so I think bringing that in to see like, have they been able kind of to see that stuff? I mean, like the green parties did it already at a time when it was not popular. Um, and so they have been sitting on those topics for a long time. Is the story of social uh, democracy hopeless? I have said that at a few conferences. I've you know, changed my position on that. Uh, people grilled me for that. <laughs> so um, so but probably because a lot don't want to hear that it's hopeless. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, there have been surveys that have been shown that there's a potential and um, people who could hypothetically imagine to vote for social democratic parties is 40%. So that would get them close to like the over 40% shares that they had in the past. Um, so I think it's probably not that hopeless if they switch to the right policies now, but now it's we are already kind of at five minutes to 12 mm -hmm. uh, for social democratic parties. Um, so if you play that for a, a while longer, that game, um, they all those generations have been socialized into the green is the new red. Um, and so uh, you have basically uh, uh, lost them. Uh, and they, it, I think what Gerd Schröder, Tony Blair and others did to social democracy is still hurting some of the working class voters like years later. Um, and so they haven't for, forgotten that. So when they now switch back and take some of those policies back, people don't even believe it. So it's like, oh, wow, they have finally realized that. Um, so, but there is not that trust anymore in, in social democracy. Um, so it is difficult to come back for them. It's five minutes to 12. Um, the question, if it will be only green parties, center right parties um, and radical right parties, I'm, I'm not sure about that. Social democratic parties probably have to live with the fact that they might not be the strongest partner in a government in the future. It could be a government under greens um, in which they are the smaller coalition partner. Um, so that is highly realistic, I would say. If they completely go down, France is already a pretty shocking example where you think like the Socialist Party is that. Um, and so um, they are basically out of the race uh, in the two presidential elections after. So that was, what was it, 6%? Yeah, or something? maybe more last time. Even, even. And they're almost caught in the time. Netherlands too. They're really in bad shape in the yes. Netherlands. Um, so they are in a bad shape. On the other hand, look at examples outside of Europe, where social democracy, I think, has reformed in a in a very successful way. So I'm now taking the New Zealand example that nobody will ever think of. If you don't come, if you don't live in New Zealand, you don't think of it. So it, the, I can't even forget it on, on maps. Um, so Jacinda Ardern, I think, is an example of someone who has still been doing redistribution of policies um, for the classic core voters of the Labour Party. Mm -hmm. Um, and at the same time, um, doing this new cultural dimension thing, um, kind of being very open and also very much on, I don't believe in these Tina arguments, like there's no alternative. There is an alternative if you want to politically. Um, and so I think she has been pretty successful with that kind of uh, course. Uh, and that could be an example for, I think, some of the European social democratic parties. And I know that some of the campaign managers have a, a very high interest uh, in how they have done that uh, in New Zealand, who showed up to some of my talks where I suddenly had a high Olaf Scholz um, and the, the employees sitting in my in my talk on a Zoom. Um, I would not even realize if somebody else would not have told me, but it was about New Zealand, actually, in that case. But they wanted to know how they win campaigns in New Zealand. 
So they look outside and say, like, where are social Demo Democrats are still surviving and what have they done to do that? So they send their people <laughs> to kind of that, that kind of talk. So I think they are on it, basically. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. The Italians may be ahead of the Germans. Mm -hmm. If you look at the last few weeks in the Italian newspapers, the new secretary general of the Democratic Party is gay. Mm -hmm. Female, mm -hmm. tri-national, because it's got three nationalities, and part Jewish. Yeah. And uh, and this was a deliberate choice. Yes, these are the identification figures the younger generation looks for. Right. The interesting thing is that they had a pre-primary vote mm -hmm. from the old timers, from the party members who were inherited from the old Communist Party and the old Christian Democratic Party, they voted for an old line Social Democrat. Mm -hmm. And then the, in the second round, when it, the primary was open to ordinary voters, they voted for her. Mm -hmm. So it seems as if we can take this second mm -hmm. ballot of the primaries as evidence of a possible mass base, mm -hmm. they're ahead of the party leadership. Yeah. So and that, and that would be that would be something where Italy, which always looks like it's behind everybody else, mm -hmm. they may be listening to the New Zealand story. Yeah, I think uh, honestly, I think this is a, a pretty smart move in that case because, as I said, I think these are the identification figures that the younger generation looks for, and this thing of things like already. Justin Trudeau saying like because it's it's what what was it twenty when when he had the majority government with women he said it's twenty forgot which year it was for whatever but he was celebrated for that um, thing like the, um, uh, the prime ministers like uh, Sana Marin um, uh, who have been of course also been accused for for partying um, but on the other hand uh, have been celebrated as as a young uh, uh, figure uh, in a certain way who does it not the old style way but I think parties are slow as we have seen with the vote here organizational learning is pretty slow and parties have also been always more extreme than the voters yeah. and so the parties are sometimes stuck still in the old policies whereas the voters are already standing somewhere else um, uh, policy wise uh, and expect them to do something else um, so if where you have kind of more open votes in a certain way like in in the second ballot suddenly that game changes um, on the other hand the italians hardly have a green party at all there is a green party but it's but it's tiny yeah, so they don't have that uh, competition uh, in a certain way uh, build up. Um, but then actually probably um, they fill the gap themselves. Um, so whereas in, in those other party systems, the Green Party has made the offer, um, I guess. Yeah. Sure. More question to, to bring it back to sort of more current events, I guess, and maybe as a counterpoint to a little bit of what we're hearing here. What about the, the, the recent protests in France about um, mm -hmm. raising the retirement age? That sounds like a very classic social democratic issue. Um, and I'm not sure who's protesting, how young those people or some of them are. Uh, but is this, I mean, I, I was sort of surprised that this is such a big issue in France. Um, given that their labor force is probably changing and their work, work, working mm -hmm. arrangements and that you wouldn't mm -hmm. necessarily think that young people would care about this. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, what's that doing to the party alignment there? Though, of course, they may not have a strong Green Party as well. And secondly, given that you're talking about Green Parties, do you think that the Green Parties is a more general question. Can can take over those classical redistributional issues that the Democratic parties had mm -hmm. still have? So um, first of all, the the French uh, uh, story. I think. Um, so the French have always been big protesters. I think this is part of the French uh, culture. So Mab Mabel has gone. <laughs> she probably Mab Mabel would, could say something to that. I think this is part of the, the culture of all generations. Um, so for example, much more than some of their neighboring countries, they have been protesting when their rights were uh, at stake. Um, so they don't have 
they don't have the same kind of, I think, obedient culture that we see in Germany, for example, compared to the French are always on the streets immediately when their rights uh, have been threatened by governments. Um, and so the protest culture there is in general bigger. And I think this is still the case, um, and it would have been probably even bigger a few generations back, um, where the unions were even stronger. Um, and so, but uh, they still go out on the street. It's part of part of their culture. Um, the French party system, it would actually have been a good opportunity for uh, the Party Socialist to come back uh, in a certain way. Um, but on the other hand, Emmanuel Macron has probably destroyed this party system single-handed. Um, so, because I mean, like he moved in and he won certain presidential elections in which the far right already came uh, pretty close, but he has destroyed the two big parties with his new big party. And once he leaves that party system, there is such a void that I'm not sure if the next presidential election is not finally the chance um, where uh, uh, Marine Le Pen uh, has has finally uh, a chance uh, to actually make it because the two and the right parties um, uh, basically are left in in pieces uh, by Emmanuel Macron. So I think it would be a good chance to now mobilize for classic social democratic topics um, uh, in France. Um, but on the other hand, um, the problem is really that Emmanuel Macron, I think, has destroyed this party system. And the one time he can't run anymore for an election is the really big void in that system because the two center, center left and center right parties are, yeah, they have imploded oh, it, it, since then. Um, and so what comes with the next presidential election, I'm not looking forward to see that in France. Um, so that is, that is uh, what, was the, what was the other part? I forgot oh, green, if green parties can sort of take over the entire role that social democratic parties were. That is, that is a good question. I think in some countries, they are almost there. So I think the German Greens have been doing very well in having a program that goes, goes far beyond. Uh, we are a climate party. We are an LGBTQ party, a woman party. And on the cultural dimension, they on the economic dimension cover everything that the SPD offers you as well. Um, so they have been, they are, have moved away from being single issue in any kind of way um, and are covering that as well. Probably they, they also had the more, more attractive um, uh, uh, staff uh, party um, um, uh, politicians to offer in recent years that were younger, um, uh, different faces. Um, and so I think in some countries, the Green parties are already there. In others, they are not that strong yet. Um, but there, the Social Democrats, I think, have, like Italy, have picked out kind of um, the others have understood that there is something at an issue lying there that you can pick up now. Um, and so it depends. The green parties are not equally strong across uh, Europe. Um, so the German greens are very far developed and are basically doing the job of the SPD since a while. Um, that is not the case in countries like Italy. Yeah. yeah. There is a green space. Mm -hmm. It's It's open. Yes. Because the, the, the new parties that have come into existence in the last decade are populist parties. And the space that they're trying to pick up is, is economic nationalism. Exactly. So it, it's left space open, but the Democrats have been very slow uh, to, to pick it up. Yeah, because as I believe, that's why we need to factor in the party side as well. Yeah. They are slow in picking that up. Uh, the organizations are very far behind. Um, that's why they also have missed, the, the train has left the station without them when it comes to the progressive issues like LGBTQ, climate change, uh, and others. And they so late have realized um, that this would be a topic that you need for the young voters uh, in the future. And you could see if we if we go back to that one for how many elections there probably was a chance to actually show that the young that you have lost the, the young voters uh, and you should have figured out why you have lost the, the young voters. Um, so the German SPD here still kind of doing okay everyone in the same thing and then it goes like the young uh, brackets go like this in your vote share in those in those groups and so you ha should have uh, realize that you are a dinosaur and something is not attractive to the younger voters uh, here. So we had a lot of elections uh, since then to figure that out, that story, I guess. But I love to talk to the parties and actually figure out when they have figured it out or if they still have. So, um, yeah. 
your LB liberal category, mm -hmm. um, could you would you call that center left? So the, the LB, can, so then I have where it's the graphs. Let me check that. So, no, it's probably in that direction. So there we have it. So that category. Yeah. So that is mostly kind of the, the liberal parties uh, in a certain way, like also libertarian, libertarian. Um, neoliberal policies, uh, those kind of parties. There's not much. So, so I would uh, <laughs> no, send a kind of picture laying out these, all those on a, on a including a radical right. So, so radical left is obviously on the far right. Radical left, right is obviously on the far right. Center right is a bit right. I don't know if it's so reasonable to, to try and sort liberal, green, and social democrat, but if you were to sort of sort them left to right, how would you? Oh, um, so I first of all, ah, I can't show you that because that is not on, I haven't sent her that presentation. I would have another one <laughs> in which there would be at least for some countries a, a, a plot for that. Um, so that depends very much on the countries. And I think the best way you could do it is with party manifesto data, where you can actually see um, how far uh, left or right they are. And so if, so if I would just sort these groups across Europe, um, then I think the radical left, of course, is the most left um, uh, followed probably currently by the, the the Green parties or the social democratic parties, but that very much depends on in which country we are. Uh, followed by the, because they are very progressive, usually on the cultural dimension by the liberal parties, uh, followed by the center right parties, followed by the radical right parties. And, and so I started from saying that the liberal the center left might be a reasonable synonym for that, just mm -hmm. it sounds like to me. You're, you're saying liberal is probably, uh, excuse, yeah. Yeah, liberal is, is probably on average a little to the right of green and social democrat. Yes. Yeah, yeah, oh, because of the economic dimension, because they are usually neoliberal uh, in a certain way. Uh, and there they are closer to the conservative parties. On the cultural dimension, they are usually closer to the green and the social democratic parties. Um, yeah. Uh, a, a future biographical question. <laughs> when do you expect to? this book to come out. Good, yeah, you mean uh, if the trans kill my book? <laughs> Your the trans could turn around in yeah. some countries, the trends. Uh, At least, I mean, like, uh, statistically, I would say we need three election to see a trend, uh, yeah. uh, kind of three, yeah. three measurement points to see a trend uh, turn. Um, and given that uh, if we look at the latest elections where we even had some social democratic prime ministers again and a social democratic chancellor in Germany, these were just um, small gains or even losses and still kind of pretty bad results far away from the 40%. I don't see them. So I think there's a chance that I can still write that book without being wrong. Um, and being the reason I ask is because of your idea mm -hmm. of having an interview phase. Yes, that is the one that I'm doing in the next two months. The, the, um, some of the, the appointments for the interviews I have already uh, made. So the interview guideline uh, is there. Um, how many countries would you interview in? Uh, probably eight. And how many political families? Um, social Demo so just just um, so I was just thinking about social democratic uh, and far right parties because I'm I'm just thinking about those two party families and if their story is related or not. The Greens are basically the profiter of that, but um, they are not the focus of my. And is sixteen. About that, in yes. Countries. Yeah. Two two families in the. Yeah, I think in the UK I had one more. Yeah. So, but, but it's about sixteen. How many? How many? In, in, how many interviews in each case? Um, as many as I get, at least two per case. Um, but if it is sometimes a snowball thing, we know that with qualitative yeah. interviews. So if if I'm there and more kind of open up as a possibility, I go for more. I just see. So some of them I do via Zoom. Some of them I will do in person in France because I also got a grant to go to France for doing. I just worry about this being such a long process mm -hmm. that by the time you're finished and you've written it up, it could be a whole new 
set of trends. Mm -hmm. But it sounds like our parties are slow too. So voters <laughs> <laughs> are not that slow. If yeah. you look at the French case, voters are not that slow. Mm -hmm. So let, let's talk about it. And I I will I promise to get you to Julia's manuscript, which I may, I forgot yes, to please. do. Um, so because I'm bad on the macrostructural arguments, that has never been part of my research. So I totally admit that. And that's the story I usually leave out. I do the microstructural <laughs> side of, uh, or the, the micro side of it. So behavior is always more my story. Um, so I love to, to read that because I actually don't think that it's kind of contradicting the argument. It's a, it's a background story. Um, to it, yes. All right, let's look here. Thank you very much, Mona. Thank you. Yeah.